Well, good Monday afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a, another one of the Detroit Regional Chambers Town Hall Series. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it seems like uh, we have been doing these for a while, and that is frankly because we have. We've been doing them uh, for such a long time that we have, I think, only our second repeat uh, guest, uh, who also is uh, from the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. The former director, Jeff Donofrio, has uh, been a two-time guest, and now uh, Sean Egan, who is the deputy director for the Department of Labor and Opportunity. He's the deputy director of labor and also the director of COVID-19 workplace safety uh, is going to be with us today. My name is Brad Williams. I'm our director, uh, vice president of government relations at the chamber. A couple things before I hand it over to Sean. If you have questions for Sean, uh, there is a question box uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, a function that you can drop a question in the box. I'll be monitoring them. Uh, if you have questions, we'll try and get as many of them answered uh, as possible. If you missed this or want to share uh, part of this session uh, with someone on your team, uh, it will be posted on the website later, www.detroitchamber.com slash COVID-19. Uh, but we wanted to bring Sean in today. Um, obviously, we know there were more, uh, another order that came out of the Department of Health and Human Services uh, last week, but uh, workplace safety has been on everyone's mind, um, especially for the last eight months uh, with COVID-19. But as we've seen, um, you know, uh, an alarming rise in the number of cases and hospitalizations, uh, there have been, there's been even more focus uh, at the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity at the steps that um, can be made, uh, you know, within MIOSHA uh, to uh, help bring the current spike uh, back into uh, some reasonable uh, form of public health. So, Sean, I know you've got a few things that you would like to share uh, with the folks who are listening in, uh, and then I'm going to jump in with a few questions and uh, try and pepper in the questions that the folks who are listening in uh, have as well. So, Sean, thank you so much for your time today, and I uh, we'll look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share with us. Well, thanks so much, Brad. It is truly an honor to be back again uh, with the Detroit Regional Chamber. For everybody watching, you should know that Brad and Sandy are communicating all of the time with us. We're trying to make sure that we're hearing what's happening on the ground and implement strategies and mitigation protocols that really make sense, that can work, and that, that you can do. Um, as employers, you know, you have a role to play for sure. You have a strong tie to your workforce and, and other things that can help us try to navigate this crisis. And as Brad mentioned, you know, the numbers are off the charts. The positivity rate is really high. We've got so much community spread. I think one important point is that uh, just it, if it hasn't already, with community spread this strong, if you are doing in-person work, it is going to be in your workplace and you need to be prepared to navigate what that means. I'm gonna share some slides, I'm gonna go really fast. I can tell you that I'm trying hard to keep up with everything that's happening and there are way too many words on these slides, but I'll explain them. And then I'll certainly share that presentation with Brad and he can get it around to anybody that'd like to see it. So you have the links and other language that's there. Uh, so we are uh, definitely trying to figure out how to show my screen again. Can you see that, Brad? I can, it looks great. Okay, so uh, we wanna talk a bit about the emergency rules as well as a couple of state emphasis programs that MIOSHA has launched, focusing in on certain industries. Uh, first and foremost, though, there's a lot of news and noise around COVID. We know there's a little flicker of light with possible vaccines coming our way, but that's going to take some time. So we've got several more months for the vast majority of us to push through and try to contain COVID. Uh, masks are critical. If we're both wearing them, they cut transmission by about as much as 70%. And that's hugely important when we know about 40% or so of the spread is coming from those that are asymptomatic, which means they're never going to get sick. That it means they're getting through those health screenings and other protocols, which is why that distance mass and hygiene is so critical. And that has been static throughout this crisis that we have to do those things. So when you're picturing these rules, when you're picturing the DHHS orders and try to navigate through them, those are the goals. To create that social distance to wear those face coverings when you can to practice good hygiene in the chance that you'll pick it up from a surface. 
So we've been tracking outbreaks in Michigan through DHHS for a long time. This hasn't, this will be updated today at some point. It hasn't been updated yet. And just for the visual, I only include workplaces where we know it's a high likelihood that these are employees. So I don't include schools, colleges, childcare, nursing homes, or detention centers because that's going to have a lot of non-employees. And as you can see, DHHS is tracking as of the 12th uh, when they posted 210 ongoing workplace outbreaks with about 63 associated with manufacturing and cons or construction and 31 from offices. And in that week prior to that posting, nine more came from offices, 28 from manufacturing or construction, 19 in retail, 21 in restaurants and bars. Most of those in retail and bars were employee exposures. And just for reference, about 17 were reported for social gatherings. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the workplace is terrible, but any place uh, we have congregation, that creates challenges as it relates to COVID. But what, when we're seeing these outbreaks being reported in the workplace, there's a couple of things there. That means you're doing what you need to do. You're reporting to local public health when you have a COVID outbreak so that they can start helping with the contact tracing. And with our community spread numbers so high, we're going to continue to see those things. And these mitigation strategies are all that much more important. So we issued emergency rules from Myosha on October 14th. When you issue emergency rules, we anticipate these being pretty static for the next six months. So get quite familiar, Im implement your plans, and then layer in the DHHS orders because those have been more variable that relate to your industry and be familiar with that. Primarily look to those rules and then add in the DHHS as those might change over time. We expect, expect the rules to remain static. So those. That's a good premise for you to help you navigate what's happening out there where we should not see a lot of changes. And then we will update anything in our rules that references CDC or DHHS as those things are necessary with FAQs. We have launched three state emphasis programs focusing in on offices, manufacturing and construction due to the nature of outbreaks. What these are, are typically randomly selected inspections of workplaces. So Myosha will pick uh, workplaces within those industry sectors and just pick out certain <laughs> industries that they're going to stop in and visit. There will be nothing underhanded. They will announce themselves and then they'll go through an inspection with my uh, the management there. This is not intended as a gotcha. This is intended to ensure that employers understand and are implementing the workplace safety rules. These are all mitigation strategies. So uh, to help fight COVID, requiring those face coverings, keeping that social distance, doing the good hygiene, keeping the cleaning, doing those things are helping to control the spread of COVID within the workplace. And that's why we're trying to do these things. Some of the must haves, if you have an inspection or just in general, you have to have that preparedness and response plan. If you don't have one of those, Myosha created a template for low and medium risk workplaces. That's the vast majority of workplaces in Michigan available on our COVID workplace safety website. You need to have a COVID coordinator. That's not necessarily a manager. That can be anybody. You can have it by department. You can have by work area. You can do that in a number of ways. That's your eyes on the ground to make sure that the protocols are being followed. You must be conducting those daily health screenings and that does need to include a questionnaire. You can use the My Symptoms app created by DHHS and U of M to do the daily health screening. It's a free employer sign up and get an access code that you give to your employees. They'll get a flag on their smartphone or tablet or whatever they're using that says they're good or they're not. Employers have a real time dashboard so they can see that everybody's taking it and who's flagged. You need to be conducting training and doing record keeping. And then I'm gonna to touch on the remote work policy because we get a lot of questions there. We get some questions around any differences between the masking requirements in our rules versus DHHS. As I mentioned, our rules are relatively static. You need to implement these and then layer in any additional things that DHHS may include because that is going to be more variable on their end as COVID changes. But in general, employers need to be providing those non-medical grade face covering, which can be cloth. You have to require employees to wear those when they're not consistently maintaining six feet of separation. And then if they're closer, the three feet because they work in close quarters. Think about adding that face shield as another mitigation strategy. As I mentioned, cloth face coverings are about 70% effective if we're both wearing those. That face shields will ramp that up more and help ensure that we're mitigating COVID as much as possible. What you want to consider there is if it creates an additional hazard. And if it does, then you're going to have to think about something else. If it doesn't, then you should really try to implement that. 
and then anywhere in shared spaces, which includes in-person meetings, restrooms, hallways, cafeterias, et cetera, employees need to put those on. So even if you're at an isolated workstation where you may not need a face covering, if you're gonna leave and go down the aisle way to the restroom, they need to put that face covering on to help uh, ensure that as they cross paths with folks that we're mitigating the spread of that virus as much as possible. Within the emergency rules, there are some additional specific rules for different types of workplaces. I'm showing here construction and manufacturing, recognizing the Detroit Regional Chamber has a lot of different members. We do have them for restaurants, personal care service, and others. And it may create additional face covering requirements depending on your industry. For construction and manufacturing, you're gonna follow the ones that I just mentioned and then layer in some a uh, couple of uh, additional specific rules for your type of work environment. The remote work, we've gotten a lot of questions on. There is a rule right now that says that employers shall create a policy prohibiting in-person work to the extent that their work activities can feasibly be completed remotely. This needs to be a written policy. It can be in your preparedness and response plan. It does not need to be a, a, a standalone document. And you should include in there at least which positions or classifications report for in-person work and why they must physically be present and then reasons that it cannot be performed remotely. This remote work policy is primarily driven, driven toward those office environments or duties that can feasibly be completed remotely. We recognize in manufacturing, construction, even in office settings at times, there is physical work that must take place at the work location. So that could, that's fine, but you need to really have a reason and thoughtful policy on why those people are there. The concept of collaboration or I like my team here is not going to be sufficient because with our COVID numbers the way that they are, as I mentioned, it's going to get into your workplace and you need to be to the maximum you can promoting that remote work, getting people out of the workplace, keeping them uh, the, out of the work environment because the strongest safety tool you have is to get rid of that hazard completely, which is why you're doing the daily health screenings, why you're doing remote work. Then you don't have COVID in the workplace, and those mitigation strategies are much more effective. I do want to spend a few moments on quarantine and isolation because there seems to be a lot of confusion and we get this question quite a bit. Uh, there is a rule now that you have to physically isolate employees with known or suspected cases. Suspected cases includes close contacts. Close contacts are people that have come within six feet or more, or six, I'm sorry, six feet or less, of someone with a confirmed case for 15 minutes or more. And what you're gonna need to do is isolate those folks and potentially quarantine them because again, we're trying to get COVID out of the workplace. And the CDC guidance on the timeline is that you quarantine. Now you quarantine when you've had a close contact, you've not had a test that's confirmed it and you have no symptoms. So the quarantine period is gonna be 14 days from the date of the last close contact. And the reason it says last close contact is in some situations, think about caring for someone in your home that has COVID, your last close contact is gonna be quite a long time as they progress through the illness. Uh, if they are able to isolate themselves in their homes from that person with COVID, then it could be 14 days from the last time they've been within six feet for 15 minutes or more. But in general, they're gonna be quarantining for quite a long period. Isolation happens when somebody develops symptoms or they are have symptoms and are confirmed or they're asymptomatic and confirmed. And that's gonna be a 10 day period from the time that symptoms first appeared or they were tested and at least 24 hours with no fever without medication and other symptoms are improving. Some symptoms linger for a long time. So you'll see a note there that loss of taste and smell can persist for quite some time and you don't need to go beyond that 10 days for that person. But you need to quarantine people right away and a negative test does not get somebody out of quarantine. That's because those symptoms can develop during that 14 day period. That's the incubation period for COVID. And if I go getting tested too early, it can I can be contagious and develop symptoms within that time frame. And then we have an FAQ posted on our COVID workplace safety website, uh, michigan.gov, COVID workplace safety. We have several FAQs that have been posted there as they've come in. It does include the question we continue to get on critical infrastructure. You should know that there are, uh, there is one difference for critical infrastructure as it relates to quarantine in the healthcare setting. There are a few differences that you'd want to be aware of, but on our work, 
Play Safety website, we have those FAQs, we have the rules, we have some links to DHHS information, we have guidelines for every industry, uh, we have uh, posters, videos, fact sheets, everything you need. And MyOSHA in about May launched a hotline that you can use for questions related to COVID at 855-SAFE-C19. It's a wonderful tool, call volume is increasing, the average wait time has increased to about 30 seconds or less. So that's still a great uh, resource for you to call directly to the MyOSHA experts. If you need it, they can help you get over to the consultation side. Uh, MyOSHA has a great consultation team that's been around for a long, long time that's available to help you. And they can get employees over to the complaint side if that is necessary. We have a few consultation programs. One you've probably seen in the news, seen in the news is the ambassador program. This is a proactive consultation program where we have people in the field that are just gonna stop in to certain types of businesses. This is focused on gyms, restaurants, bars, retail, generally open to the public type spaces that don't normally interact with MyOSHA. They do have some workplace ha hazards. They are covered by MyOSHA, but there's not a lot of complaints there and they may not be large enough to have their own independent safety people. They can request a consultation or our folks are just gonna pop in and offer some guidance as well as the opportunity for a longer, longer consultation. For all under other industries, you can go right to MyOSHA's website, click on the consultation tab, and you can request a consultation from the experts in MyOSHA. This uh, includes both on-site and off-site consultations. They'll work with you on different plan aspects and other things that you may need. MyOSHA's goal truly is to educate before they regulate, and we've been working really hard, including events like this, to make sure that you have the tools and resources you need, try to answer questions the best that we can. We know that employers are working hard to mitigate risk while they're trying to operate. We know that working people need to work, and we wanna make sure that you have the tools to get open and stay open the best that we can. We have links to a bunch of great websites, including the My Symptoms app that I mentioned, the Michigan Economic Development Corps Pure Michigan Business Connect connects to Michigan manufacturers that create barriers, PPE, sanitizer, and they do have capacity if you're looking for those types of things. If you make those things, you can connect there. And uh, with that, I will stop yakking, knowing that I went really, really fast, and that is a pile of information, but try to be thorough. So, so here's what I'm going to do, Sean. I am going to um, I'm going to talk for a minute so you can drink some water because you have been you've been going a mile a minute. Um, first thing I, I'm going to say uh, for the benefit of the people listening in is that uh, Sean and the entire senior leadership team on Leo at Leo makes themselves available uh, to not just us at the Detroit Regional Chamber, but uh, all of the business community uh, and, and the organizations that you're members of uh, on a regular basis. We get together uh, on Thursday afternoons uh, every week. We probably won't this Thursday because we'll all be uh, eating turkey, but every other Thursday. And so, you know, if there are other issues that uh, kind of percolate up to the top that you'd like us to uh, get uh, to Sean and uh, the other colleagues at Leo, uh, please let myself know um, and, and we'll make sure that gets them. So first question we had from a member uh, of our audience, Sean, um, to kind of go back to the beginning of your presentation and to talk about the outbreaks uh, in the workplace. Can you, for the people who are listening in, kind of put a definition around what an outbreak is? Is that just one case or is that multiple cases? Is there a time period in which those cases have to occur? Sure, DHHS is recording outbreaks and their definition of that is two or more. So uh, think of a person coming in with COVID and they've transmitted it to another person at your workplace. That would be counted in the, the uh, outbreak numbers. Now, the challenge there, of course, is, you know, if you're a huge workplace, we don't know if it's from what we see. We don't know if it's two people or if it's 200, but it's going to be two or more linked to that uh, occurrence in the workplace. Um, I would also encourage everyone to uh, take advantage of the education programs that Sean uh, just referenced. In fact, that's uh, a big part of the reason why we wanted to have Sean here on the Thursday calls, which I talked about. You know, we talked about the new state emphasis program, but also the education and consultation programs that uh, the state is, uh, is encouraging people to take advantage of. 
Um, as far as the uh, points of emphasis, Sean, I know this summer, I'm sure you had the same experience uh, and into the fall, you know, you'd get on a Zoom call like this and you'd see one or two people who were in their office, right? Trying, you know, I had to get away. I needed some peace and quiet. I'm assuming that uh, in this these new points of emphasis, that's probably not included in a COVID preparedness plan. Could you just kind of talk a little bit more about that as to what it's gonna look like for offices, because it seems like if there's any place in my you know, experience that maybe people have been a little bit more fast and loose with the rules, that may be it. Yeah, I think offices present some unique challenges. First, they are one of those industries that does not routinely engage with MyOSHA. There, there are hazards in those workplaces. There are requirements that you have to meet, but they're pretty limited, right? You don't have chemicals. You don't have the normal stuff that you would see out in a production site or a construction site where they are engaged more frequently with workplaces. Part two of that is that we all work closely together and we're teams. So everybody knows that visiting your family right now, you shouldn't. But if you are, uh, it's hard to wear masks, right? It seems odd. It seems peculiar. You're very comfortable with folks. You know each other pretty well. Uh, it, so that creates another uh, concept where people might be a little more lax on, you know, I know this person, everything should be fine. Uh, that's just not true right now. And what MyOSHA is going to look for in that state emphasis program, especially with offices, is really look at those remote work policies. And I know me being one of them would much rather be in the office setting, uh, but that's just not feasible right now because our numbers are so uh, high, our positivity rate is so high. Anybody you're letting into that workplace now, you have to just treat as like COVID's coming in, so I need to mitigate as much as I can. Like Brad said at the outset, you know, trying to get our numbers back into a manageable range until we can get to the point where these vaccines are being distributed. So an employee just wanting to be there is not going to be sufficient. Uh, just wanting to have the team around, just, you know, we just can't do it right now. So I've got a question here, Sean, from uh, the Clawson Chamber of Commerce, and I would uh, imagine this may apply to others. Um, and they're indicating that their chamber is located in Clawson City Hall, and it's a one-person office. Um, and asking if they can utilize the city's preparedness plan. And I would I would imagine that would apply to other uh, workplaces as well, uh, where they may be subleases uh, in, in in other commercial buildings. Yeah, I think uh, as an, a separate employer, you're going to need your own plan. Now, if you choose to work with the city on how they're letting people in and out and all that kind of stuff, and even the the pieces that they put together and simply want to copy and paste as long as it's thorough, as long as you've you know looked at it and understand it, that's fine. Uh, but you know, recognize that if Myosia does stop in to see you, they're gonna look for your plan. And if you say, well, it's down the hall at the other place, you know, that's probably not sufficient, but it's fine if you just take it and you know uh, use use that template as yours. For those of us who uh, you know have only worked in an office, um, and have never uh, been uh, subject to a visit from Myosha. What does it look like? I mean, I, I'm assuming they're not coming in right with like uh, you know protective vests and you know heavy armor. But what does that look like? What would it look like if um, you know the if Myosha were to stop by the chamber office today to check on our preparedness plan? Yeah, I think that uh, you should not be nervous. You should just engage and talk with Myosha. Their goal is to educate. Um, I had the privilege of doing a ride along. We This isn't our first emphasis program. We did one for hospitals. We did one for retail, restaurants, bars, and others. I participated in a ride along with the restaurants and bars. The Myosha investigator, very professional, will stop in uh, and try to identify the manager or owner, depending on who's there, and let them know that Myosha is here to conduct an inspection. Then they will sit down with, with you and the first thing they're going to ask for is your plan and they'll go through your plan with you and then they'll do a, a walk around your building to kind of see what mitigation strategies you're putting into place and they'll talk with you about uh, what pieces are good and what pieces you're missing and those types of things. Just them stopping in does not mean you're getting cited. These are industry professionals that are there to help you. Now, when you talk about the workplace preparedness plan, we've got a couple questions in here about the preparedness plan. Um, and I know you've got the, the, the great consultation service and, and for the specifics, I would really push people to the, the consultation service. So, um, but what 
is there is there a suggestion as far as what a good preparedness plan looks like? Is there a preferred format um, that Myosha likes? Um, you know, I think everyone knows. You know, when when you get pulled over by you know police officer, you know, ten and two license and registration, right? You want to have everything prepared so as to you know make it as easy as possible for the police officer in hopes that he or she will be uh, pleased with you and less likely to write you a ticket. I mean, I think that's the same thing everyone would like uh, if they get a visit from Myosha, right? Ease the way so so there's uh, less likely that, that there's an enforcement action. So is, are there things in a preparedness plan that employers should be ready to put in so as to make it easier for a MIOSH inspector that does stop by? So uh, our folks are really savvy and they can identify, you don't have to use our key safety phrases, right? Like uh, uh, engineering controls. You can say, I changed my ventilation system. They'll understand those things. Those That's all fine. Uh, you know, using that template that we've created and just looking at the bullets. You don't have to look at all the language if you already have a plan, but just looking at the bullets because they're going to ask you about some things. Uh, you're going to have to do a hazard identification for your employees. You might not know what that means. That's in the template. It means you're you're categorizing the risk to your workers. Uh, you're going to need the the frameworks of the daily health screenings, how you're doing training, and the record keeping. You're going to need to identify engineering or administrative controls. Now that's my OSHA lingo. Engineering controls are things that don't rely on human behavior. So physical barriers, ventilation changes, things like that. Uh, administrative controls are things that do rely on human behavior for them to follow your policy. So that's going to include the daily health screenings, um, other cleaning protocols that you have in place and things like that. Uh, so no, there's no specific template. You're just gonna to wanna to make sure that you have you know, you've looked at the rules and you have those headings in there that this is what I'm doing for this. This is what I'm doing for that. You know, every morning when we wake up, Sean, it seems like I look at my phone and there's a new uh, positive news uh, on a vaccine trial. Um, how do you see Myosha's regulations kind of shifting as vaccinations start happening, right? So, um, you know, there's obviously, you know, universal masking requirements right now. What is it going to look like when maybe 30% of employees have been vaccinated and maybe don't need a mask for their own public health? How, how, how do you see that working from a MyOSHA perspective? Um, so, like I mentioned, we created these rules thinking of like what will need to be in place for the next six months. We are seeing that positive news on vaccines. Just reiterate that. We have to keep our head down though, because we're all seeing that same news that says, maybe by the end of the year, we start with medical workers. Maybe by mid next year, we're through a significant portion of the population. So we're gonna see a lot of these things be in place. I think what we would see as possibly a shift uh, would just be the necessity to continue these types of strategies longer into 2021. So for the next several months, we're just sort of, uh, all of us, everybody watching us, we're just in the head down, keep it moving forward to contain COVID. Well, Sean, we've just come up uh, about against our time. I really appreciate uh, the time that uh, you've spent with us today. I appreciate all the work that's going on uh, at the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Like I said earlier, we get to spend some time with you and the team there uh, uh, at least once a week. So we know uh, the hard work that's going on there to keep uh, both businesses uh, and our and their employees uh, uh, productive and safe, so the work uh, it doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, before we uh, sign off today, one I would encourage everyone who's listening in uh, to download uh, the My COVID app uh, that's referenced in Sean's presentation. We'll post this on the chamber website, uh, but it really helps with contact tracing uh, and will tell you if you've been exposed to someone else who also has the app. So I'd strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, soon. Um, and I hope, I really hope everyone has a safe uh, and happy Thanksgiving, uh, a socially distant Thanksgiving uh, that's uh, filled with lots of turkey. I understand uh, Butterball still uh, grew plenty of 20 pound turkeys. Um, and there's going to be a lot of people uh, with only five people around the table to eat them. So thanks. Thanksgiving leftovers are going to be plentiful this year. Uh, so I hope you will uh, enjoy those too. And uh, look back at the Chamber website later this afternoon where we'll have this posted uh, and Sean's presentation as well. So thank you, Sean, for your time, and we will look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you.